Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second Voter Education Forum. Thank you for going the presidential debate tonight, and yes, I could have scheduled better. Uh, tonight's agenda will be a debate on Prop 57, a uh, discussion on Prop 58, and a debate on Prop 61. In consideration of our speakers, please turn your cell phone ringers off, put them on vibrate, or silent. Uh, before any of our debaters get up on the podium, we're going to have a presentation by the League of Women Voters, uh, whose chapter president, Kathy Schick, will discuss each of the uh, propositions on the agenda tonight. Kathy, it's all yours. We never support or oppose any political party or candidate. We have two separate and distinct goals. The first is voter service, presenting impartial information such as I'm doing tonight. The second is action and advocacy, advocating for or against particular policies in the public interest. Um, types of propositions that come up in California include bonds, of which tonight none of the three is, thank goodness. Um, the others are constitutional amendments, uh, for which we have a couple tonight, the initiative statutes, which we have at least two, and referendums, which we have one of also tonight. Propositions can be initiated by the legislature or by citizens. In evaluating valid propositions, you should look to see if you agree with their goals. Look to see who are the sponsors and the opponents. Is the measure well written? Especially if you read through the entire fine print. How well written are you sure it is? Well, has the fiscal impact been addressed? Is it very complex? If it amends the state constitution, as we'll see not so much tonight, but in other propositions on this ballot for November, that can be a serious problem and means that every new proposition or even law addressing the issue must re-amend the state constitution. So you need to look to see if there might be another way to get the same goal. And then finally, does the advertising rely on motion and lack substance? And who pays for that advertising? Now, my figures are actually a whole day old, and this changes by the hour. You'll notice from last week, we've already changed the amounts being paid by various advertisers for all of the propositions. So I have to admit, my material is 24 hours old, may not be completely up to date, but it's the best I can do for you at this time. Um, you can go to the website, as we would suggest, and get more up-to-date information. And again, I highly recommend everybody look at Voters Edge of California. All you have to do is type in your address and your zip code, and it will tell you exactly what your ballot will look like and what are the issues, and it will give you pretty good rundowns on those issues. Impartial. Okay, so 
let's look at what we're looking at tonight. We've got three propositions up for tonight. Um, proposition 57, which is the parole, sentencing, and court procedures. This is a citizen's proposal to amend the state constitution, but it also creates new law in two different codes, but we won't get into that. The important thing to remember about this particular proposition is it has two very different parts. Part one is sentences for adult felons. The present situation is that the state law in the California Penal Code identifies 23 felonies, uh, including murder, robbery, and rape, as violent. Other felonies may be classified as non-violent just because they're not violent, according to this. Convicted felons will receive either a determinate sentence, this is a fixed term with a specified release date, and that's based on the determinate sentence law in 1977, signed by then Governor Jerry Brown, or an indeterminate sentence with no specific maximum, such as 25 years to life. Okay, so a 2009 federal court mandate to reduce the state's prison population resulted in some changes. Felons serving determinate sentences for non-violent crimes are now eligible to be considered for parole after serving half their sentence. Felons serving indeterminate sentences for non-violent crimes can be considered for parole after the minimum portion of the sentence has been served. Over two-thirds of the inmates are also now eligible to receive credits for good behavior, including participating in work, training, or education programs, etc. Prop 57 would change the state's constitution as follows. Individuals convicted of nonviolent felonies, those the law does not specifically define in the 23 violent crimes, would be eligible for parole consideration after serving the full prison term for their primary offense. Before being considered for parole and or release, nonviolent felons currently serve an average of two years. They would now serve an average of a year and a half before being considered for parole or release under this. Finally, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation would be authorized to increase the amount of sentence credits inmates could earn for rehabilitation, good behavior, or educational achievements. Part two of this proposition concerns juvenile criminal proceedings. The present situation here is that youth accused of committing crimes when they were under 18 may be tried in juvenile or in adult court. For youth tried in juvenile court, the judge determines the appropriate placement in county juvenile facility or for very serious offenses in a state juvenile facility such as CYA, the rehabilitation treatment, such as drug treatment based on the youth's offense and criminal history, and notes when released, these youth will be supervised in the community by county probation officers. Currently, youth accused of committing crimes when they were 14 or older can be tried directly in adult court and receive adult sentences in three situations. Automatically, if the youth is accused of committing murder or certain sex offenses with special circumstances. <laughs> At the prosecutor's discretion, if the youth has a significant criminal history and or is accused of certain crimes. <laughs> At the judge's discretion, based on a hearing requested by the prosecutor. Note that a 2016 report found that these were not evenly applied over various ethnic groups in the youth population and in the various counties. Very uneven application of the 
uh, prosecutor's discretion. So Proposition 57 <coughs> would change the law as follows. Uh, regardless of the nature of the offense or other circumstances, all youths under 18 have a hearing initially in juvenile court before they can even be considered for transfer to adult court. So the fiscal effect is likely to result from Prop 57 in a net state, state savings up into the tens of millions of dollars annually, primarily due to reductions in the prison population. Savings would depend on how certain provisions are implemented. Net county costs are likely at most of a few million dollars annually. They would be increased county costs because many of these would be sent back to the county level, especially juvenile. So let's see who pays for all this. Okay, yes, on Prop 57 has raised a total of 11 million 116 plus thousand dollars. The biggest chunk of that came from Governor Brown's ballot measure committee. He felt it was a way to make up for what he had signed into law in 90. Um, California Democratic Party chipped in another large amount. Um, so they've got 4,000, oh, 4, 4 million, sorry from uh, the Governor Brown's major ballot measure, um, over one million from the Democratic Party. And this is interesting because this just came up in the last week. Suddenly I see Thomas Strider, I think is his name. Yeah, Strider, okay. I looked him up, it's S-T-R. That's what it, well, that's what it shows up in the, um, anyway, I looked him up in Facebook, no, in uh, Wikipedia. And apparently he's a, Philanthropist, he's a hedge fund operator, and he's also an environmentalist. So they say. Well, anyway, he's given um, $1,500,000 to this and the same amount to quite a few other measures, as we'll see even later tonight. Um, on the other hand, the top donors for uh, new are the Los Angeles Association for Deputy Sheriffs and Association of Deputy District Attorneys and other law enforcement agencies. They have not raised nearly so much, but they have over $500,000. Okay, so Prop 58 is next. And that is our new language education. Um, this is a legislative proposal passed by the majority of, of the legislature in 2014 to modify an existing law. Why would the legislature need a referendum? Because of Proposition 227, which was an initiative passed by the voters in 1998. And in this Prop 227, all English learners must be taught totally in English after their initial one-year adjustment language period. It is seriously restricts the use of bilingual programs. It requires the schools to provide one year of intensive English instruction before transitioning learners to English-only classes. It requires parents of English learners to come to the school site and sign a waiver if they want their children considered for bilingual instruction. So, the current situation. Federal law requires that all schools in states receiving federal funds, and all states do, um, teach English to non-English speaking students. But there's no specific federal directive as to how. Schools must teach English learners in English-only programs after one year of special English intensive instruction. Parents must come to school to sign the waivers for their children to be considered for bilingual instruction. School districts and county offices of education must publish yearly plans describing services and consult with parents and community 
or for adopting these plants. Under Prop 58, schools could use a variety of programs, including bilingual programs to teach English learners. Parents would not need to sign waivers before their children could enroll in bilingual programs. So, Prop 58's fiscal effect is not noticeable on school districts or on the state government. Any school creating a bilingual program, yes, would incur some one-time costs but not necessarily adding costs because schools routinely revise their curriculum, purchase new materials, and train their teachers. Starting or expanding bilingual programs would become much easier for all districts. And bilingual programs would probably become much more common in the state. So who's paying for these ads? Well, as you can see, the yes on Prop 58 total money raised is over three million dollars, and how much is 150? Uh, what? One million? No, it was 150,000. I don't believe that's correct. Right. But anyway, he was the biggest, so he must be 100, one, one million five hundred thousand, just as he did for the others because he's done the same amount for each. I apologize for my mistake in here. Um, California Teachers Association has put in some money, and the next in climate is the next major donor. So who's putting on ads against it? No one at this point. They haven't organized against it. So there doesn't seem to be any real organized dissension at this point in time. All right. And next is Prop 61, and last, thank goodness, I don't think time is okay to go. Um, Prop 61 relates to prescription drugs and prescription drug costs. This is an initiative statute, a citizen initiative to adopt a new law. The present situation is that the state of California paid $3.8 billion in the last fiscal year on prescription drugs for state employees, prisoners, and Medi-Cal patients. A federal agency, the U.S. Veteran Affairs, the VA, hereafter, often gets a better deal on drugs for their 9 million veterans than the state of California. Under Prop 61, the state would pay, or could be allowed to pay, no more for a prescription drug than the lowest price paid by the VA for the same drug. The upper limit would apply regardless of how the state pays for those drugs. Now note, Prop 61 drug pricing requirements would apply only to the fee for service system and not to the managed care system which the managed care system includes 75% of the lowest income recipients, Medi-Cal and New Orleans. So notice there's a big group being left out in this case. Okay, Prop 61 fiscal effects. We really don't know. It's hard to be clear. First of all, the VA does not always make their drug prices public. Secondly, drug companies might raise their prices for the VA or simply refuse to sell to the state of California. So who's paying for the ads you will see and telephone messages you might get? Okay, yes, on Prop 61, total money raised is $14 million plus as of yesterday. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation, obviously a group of recipients who really feels the pinch of drug costs, has donated 14 million plus. Um, the California Nurses Association has donated the next largest amount, which is over $50,000. Okay, so who's put money into the number 86 million dollars? 
most of it from outside of the state of California, another interesting fact. All right, the biggest donors are Johnson & Johnson, Merck, and Pfizer, the big guys, and they each chipped in over $7 million each. Uh, other major donors are all pharmaceutical companies to date. Couldn't find any that worked. So, um, unless you have major, simple reference questions, I'm done, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kathy. Our uh, first two debaters on Prop 57 are Mr. Frankie Guzman speaking in favor of the measure and Ms. Cynthia De Silva, De Silva speaking against the measure. Mr. Guzman is staff attorney with the National Center for Youth Law. This organization helps low-income children achieve their potential by transforming the public agencies that serve them. The center focuses on issues of the foster care system, the school to prison pipeline, physical and mental health services, and the juvenile justice system. Ms. De Silva is an ADA with the San Joaquin County DA's office. As I'm sure she will remind you, Ms. De Silva is here representing herself only, not representing the DA's office. And with that, Mr. De Silva, you're on. Who's mine? I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll have 10 minutes for your opening. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, let's try that again. I know it's late. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Uh, my name is Frankie Guzman, uh, and as Eric said, I'm the staff attorney with the National Center for Youth Law. I also had the uh, pleasure of helping develop the juvenile portion of, of this initiative. And you know, aside from being uh, one of its uh, promoters and developers, you know, I, I really believe strongly that this is the right way to go as a state in terms of criminal and juvenile justice reform. Uh, first and foremost, uh, because it will improve public safety by shifting our over-reliance on wasteful and harmful prisons uh, while, while investing in uh, effective proven strategies that, that focus on rehabilitation and especially for youth. And as I'm sure our opposition will argue, as they have uh, throughout this campaign, that the way to improve public safety is to lock up more Californians for longer periods of time with no hope, no rehabilitation, only to waste the way in prison. But I also support this initiative because it's very personal to me and I'm uh, happy to share and be honest that uh, I am a person who is system involved or was system involved. At the age of 15, I robbed a liquor store um, in Ventura County. On my first offense, I, I, a judge reviewed my case and decided to keep me in the juvenile system. I was given a 15-year sentence, and of that sentence, I served six, six years in California Youth Authority. And because I was tried in juvenile court where a judge was able to decide, uh, I was able to move on with my life, ultimately enroll in community college upon release, attend UC Berkeley, and ultimately graduate from UCLA School of Law to become an attorney and give the kids, or help uh, fight to give kids opportunities that I didn't have that I think are so important for uh, positive development. So, you know, as we've already discussed, uh, I think the, the person who's speaking did a good job of summarizing what Prop 57 does. Uh, but I, first, let me uh, just start off with the most important to me, which is it'll end the practice of direct file, which is it'll remove the power and discretion of DAs to charge kids as young as 14 in California's adult criminal justice system. And it, instead, it'll require that only a judge make that decision after uh, a, a transfer hearing where the judge is able to uh, decide based on background, the kid's background and facts, uh, facts of the case. But also uh, on, the, on the back end, it'll improve rehabilitation through uh, a parole process for nonviolent offenders. And as I will explain uh, in a bit, this will cover an estimated 1,300 prisoners to date. Um, 
and lastly, it'll provide rehabilitation um, uh, incentives for people in prison through uh, good time credits. And I would like to just point out that the nonviolent parole process and the uh, good time credits are currently in place in California. This would just seek to expand these procedures in a way that would be uh, certified to promote public safety after a public regulatory process. So, uh, to be clear, you know, uh, Prop 57 will move us in the, in the state in a, in, a, in a direction that will advance rehabilitation and public safety. And it will do that by restoring discretion to ex experienced experts, uh, decision makers. And what I mean by that is it will restore discretion to judges about who makes decisions regarding youth in adult courts. It will restore discretion to the prison system regarding awarding the awarding of good time credits for good behavior and rehabilitative achievements, and it will restore discretion to the Board of Prison Hearings regarding eligibility and the process for nonviolent parole. And most, most importantly, one thing that um, our opposition rarely or if ever talks about is the fact that both the nonviolent parole pieces, uh, piece and the good time credits will be dependent, meaning that is the details will be, will be decided by CDCR and the Board of Prison Hearings in a public regulatory process where, where the public, victims, law enforcement, and all stakeholders will have a say in, in the outcome. Why do we need Prop 57? Well, in a nutshell, you know, over the last three decades, California has ramped up punishment to the complete exclusion of rehabilitation. We passed over 1,000 crime bills, increased incarceration rate by more than 500%, and increased our prison population to 200% design capacity. California's prison system recently was found to be unconstitutional and is currently under federal receivership. If we don't address the overcrowding problem, a, com a compliance officer may arbitrarily release uh, prisoners from prison. Moreover, and important to me, is since 2003, more than 10,000 youth as young as 14 have been prosecuted as adults, more than 10,000 since 2003, and 70% of whom were direct filed. That, mean, that means a DA decided and not a judge. But also, 80% of those 10,000 were black and Latino youth. Mm -hmm. A system that focuses on, on punishing crime rather than rehabilitating does not stop the revolving door of crime. It makes our, our communities less safe. California currently spends $10 billion a year, that's 10% of our general fund, on prisons. And that doesn't even count uh, counties, county jails, juvenile halls, or probation camps. We've wasted billions while failing to effectively stop crime when between 60 and 70% of people who leave prison return within three years. And that's again because we've invested in locking people up for longer periods of time and disinvested from rehab to help prisoners learn from their mistakes and improve their lives. Our prisons have become dangerous and overcrowded warehouses, leaving people unprepared to re-enter society. And all that, and we know it works. I know from personal experience, my own experience, as a professional, I work inside prisons, I work with re-entry, I work with community groups like Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, and what I can tell you is there's no, there, there's no bigger threat to public safety than the lack of hope. And already, you know, we were beginning to see many people inside prison get really excited about the prospect of, of parole or uh, increased good time credits and are beginning to demand more rehabilitative programs. Um, and as I told you, my, I myself uh, was able to turn my life around and I, can, I credit that to the services that I received in community college. I had to leave the prison system to get help. And with education and counseling, I was able to get my life back on track and, and as I said before, be able to give back to communities and youth. So what is direct file? As I said before, um, it is a process by which DAs have the, the, the discretion to charge kids directly in adult court. 14 states in the nation have this. Um, in, under direct file, there is no statutory guidance, there's no transparency, and there's no judicial oversight for arbitrary and biased decision making. And for example, in San Joaquin, last year, 2015, there were 50 direct files, up 45% from the previous year. San Joaquin ranked number eight in the highest rate of direct files in the, in the state, while the state, uh, average, uh, the state uh, juvenile felony arrest rate dropped by 
Let's compare San Joaquin to Alameda, which has a similar number of juvenile felony arrests. Uh, Alameda County last year had 356 serious juvenile felonies. San Joaquin had 317. But Alameda only direct filed 10 youth that year. So it is definitely arbitrary uh, and, and I would say from personal experience, harmful. Um, alternatively, youth charged, uh, I mean, prosecuted under this plan would have a hearing where a judge would get to decide after considering the youth's background and a lot more information in a process that typically takes about six months, where with direct file, a DA typically has 48 hours to make a decision about whether or not, which I believe often results in, in miscarriages of justice. It also improves the parole process. And as I said before, um, there is a current non-violent parole process that has been in place for two years that covers about 5,500 inmates currently. The CDCR's estimate is that 1,300 more prisoners will be covered under this law. But just to give you an example of how the system is working, uh, last year of, of the people who were paroled under non-violent parole, less than 1% were surveyed so far. Um, and also, let me just emphasize that eligibility for parole is by no means a guarantee. Our, our Board of Prison uh, Parole Hearings is comp comprised of 12 commissioners, 11 of which are, are experienced law enforcement officials. That's prosecutors, sheriffs, police chiefs, and corrections officials. And the primary objective in that hearing is whether or not the inmate poses an unreasonable threat to public safety and can take into account his record uh, and prison conduct. Also, it encourages rehabilitation by incentivizing good behavior and rehabilitative achievements in the form of good time credits. And again, every state in the nation has a good time credit system. California also does. And so this is nothing new. This has been tested and proven effective. And again, in the last two years, under the federal court order, California has increased good time credits. And under the current program of those people who had an accelerated release because of earning good time credits, only 14% have recidivated, compared to between 60 and 70% of people who are released with a determinant sentence uh, without considering whether or not they rehabilitated. And so um, that is my time, and I will reserve questions, uh, or I'll answer questions from the, thank you. Speaking against measure 57, this is Cynthia Tissola. Thank you. 
more. Just like two years ago, there was a similar um, ballot proposition on the ballot that people thought was going to protect them, but it actually did the opposite. Okay, so let me start with the history. Back in the 1990s, as some of you will remember, California went through um, a, an explosion of gang crime. Gang crime has been going on since at least the 1940s, definitely since the 1970s, and in the 1990s, we started to get smart. And we passed laws um, to make everyone safer. In 2000, the voters, you folks, passed the um, Prop 21, the Gang Violence and Crime Prevention Act. That was aptly titled. Because what the Gang Violence and Prevention Act did was it made, it got tougher on gang laws, it made certain gang offenses criminal acts, and it also gave us the opportunity to file against juveniles in, directly in the adult court. Now my opponent is correct. The way the law currently stands, prosecutors under certain limited circumstances, he didn't tell you that, but under certain limited circumstances, prosecutors can file against juveniles without seeking the permission of a judge. I'll be arguing to you folks why that's an important thing, an important protection for you. One thing that we started to notice back when gang crime started to explode back in the 1990s is that gangsters got smart. And they realized that the laws um, against adults were tougher than the laws against juveniles. And so what did they start to do? They started to recruit juveniles to commit their crimes. Why did they do that? Because they knew they could convince the juveniles, don't worry, you'll get off easier than the adults will. So juveniles were getting involved in crimes. If, if you're going to have 18-year-olds who are going to go commit these acts, um, why not go get a 16-year-old to do it? So Prop 21 gave us the opportunity to crack down on that and convince youngsters, don't do this. Your older brother, who is 18 or 19, is convincing you to do that. He's wrong now. The law has changed. I don't want to see us take a step backward. After we passed Prop, Prop 21, uh, the backlash began to happen immediately. These activists from Oakland, and I do believe my opponent from the uh, national, whatever his organization was, I believe it's an Oakland law firm, an Oakland-based law firm. Activists from Oakland uh, began a public relations campaign. Certain places called Books Not Bars, they, they were very successful. They sought to tell Californians that we were being too tough on juveniles, and the laws um, started to whittle away. Eventually, they became very successful. In the year 2007, Governor Schwarzenegger signed SB uh, 81, which made it much more difficult to send uh, violent juvenile offenders to CYA. So these days, there was a lot fewer folks in CYA. They now call it DJJ. They changed the name of it. They changed everything about it. And um, CYA isn't what it used to be, for better or for worse. There's some people that agree with those changes. But what is a fact is that it has changed quite significantly, and it is much more difficult to send violent youth to CYA, so I don't know if my opponent happened before or after that change, but it's much more difficult to do it now. I would also note that he said he, said he spent 15 or 16 years on a robbery. Well, I know that the maximum you can get on a robbery is five years, so there may be more going on in this case. Before you get too emotionally involved in things, you really do, you do need to look at the underlying um, factors for it. Five years is the maximum you can get for a robbery. There had to have been more involved there. All right. So once the juvenile folks, the Books Not Bars people got successful, they started to bring their campaign over into the adult realm. Some of this was already going on. Prisoners, you know, um, they like to cause trouble. They do. That's one of the reasons that they're there. So they file a lot of lawsuits. In the 1990s, one of the lawsuits they were filing was um, in order to try to get better health care. Eventually, that became successful. In 2009, as Kathy indicated to you, um, they were successful in a lawsuit. A three-judge panel ordered Governor Brown to um, decrease the prison population. That is why Governor Brown has been all of a sudden decreasing criminal um, penalties, trying to get people out sooner because he no longer has the ability to keep a certain number of people in prison. That is why we're seeing the number of changes that we've been seeing in the law, and that's why we have Prop 57 on the ballot, partially. So, 2011, do any of you folks remember AB 109? Okay, they call that realignment. So AB 109 was not a ballot initiative. That was something that the governor and the legislature signed together. The reason they did that was they were under this court order to reduce the prison population to 137.5% or something of its current capacity. Um, there was a formula. And the way he decided to do it was to move most of those prisoners from the state prison to the county jail, transferring the cost from the states to the county. So you see it's a shell game. 
Uh, it, it had a lot of bugs to it. They tried to work out those bugs, but we in the criminal justice system are looking at programs for them. The state prison does have programs. It's called uh, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. They have lots of programs for these individuals to get their degrees, to get certifications, so that in the event they get out, they, are, they do have marketable skills. The counties don't have that. They are there to house people for a limited amount of time. But in any event, AB 109 passed, and then the governor, in order to not have a huge public outcry, um, engaged in his own public relations campaign, and you folks were told, because I know you watch the news, don't worry, only nonviolent felons are going to be sent. Right. You were lied to. Nonviolent is a term of art, and Prop 57 tells you the same lie. I will show you some things considered nonviolent. All right. So, I said two years ago there was a measure on the ballot, Prop 47. If I were you and I'm looking at a ballot pamphlet that thick, I don't have all day to be reading this. Heck, I wish I had all day. You need a week to read these ballot pamphlets at this point. But Prop 47, on the title alone, you're going to vote for that? The Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act? Of course! Who's against the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act, right? It wasn't safe. Here's what Prop 47 did, which the California voters bought hook, line, and sinker, and it's now law, and we're dealing with it. In the name of public safety, it reduced most commercial burglaries to misdemeanors. It reduced most acts of serial shoplifting to misdemeanors. It reduced most acts of grand theft firearm to misdemeanors, and most uh, acts of drug possession, even great weight drug possession, to misdemeanors. So, misleadingly titled, Prop 57 learned from that, and they've given it also a misleading title. They call it the Public Safety and Rehabilitation Act. There's nothing public safety about it. The misleading opening lines, if all you had time was to read the first paragraph, you'd vote for this. Protect and enhance public safety, save money. Here's what it does. It allows for significant earlier parole for nonviolent offenders. It allows for CDCR to expand credits, but doesn't give them any, any guidance on how to do it. It gives juvenile judges the sole right to decide if a person under 18 gets tried as an adult. I disagree with my opponent, but that's a good thing, which I'll explain. What is a nonviolent felony? The law is poorly written, it doesn't tell you. But with what we know from reading other statutes, here's what it does. Assault with a deadly weapon on a peace officer, nonviolent. Rape of an unconscious person, nonviolence. Witness intimidation, certain gang crimes, arson. How about exploding a bomb with the intent to injure? Nonviolent crimes. You want to vote for this measure? Here's what you're voting to uh, let out quite a bit early. Now I'm running out of time, so let me sit for it a little bit. I'm going to radically shorten time. I think I'm actually going to run out of time, run out of time for everything here. Gosh. Oh, good, I'm good. All right. Thank you. Oh, it says two minutes left. Oh, OK, thank you. All right. So here's what it's going to do, a couple of things. Number one, it's going to take, let me give you a good example, actually. Okay, this guy, let's say he's a recidivist, so he's a, a felon in possession of a firearm, can't have a firearm, right? Let's say he's been to prison five times. You get an extra, five, get an extra one year for each of those times. Let's say he gets a two-year sentence for possessing the firearm, then he gets an additional, oh, okay, thank you very much. I'm so sorry I ran out of time, but I do have a chance to answer questions later on yeah. Several, rather. 
Um, and, and to just clarify for those of you who were not listening, I, I said I got a 15 year sentence and served six of those years. Uh, but you know, I, I, I have the, the pleasure of also acknowledging that this initiative is endorsed by the Chief Probation Officers Association of California, uh, a, a leader in rehabilitation in the law enforcement community. It is also endorsed by District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis in San Diego. It is supported by numerous law enforcement officials as well as victims of crime and virtually every youth serving organization in the country. And that's because these people understand what's at stake. We cannot continue to lock our way out of a perceived threat or problem. We cannot continue to respond to, to violence or, or these you know, just social ills with the jail cell. The, the Supreme Court of the United States has already told us so. What the DA is not telling you is one, the real problem here is that prosecutors do not want to lose power, plain and simple. By shifting power to discretion to judges, to the prison system, and to the board of prison hearings, what that means to them is they lose that power. Over the last few years, or rather the last few decades, previous ballot, ballot initiatives, largely uh, promoted by the DA's association, the sheriff's association, have given themselves powers to a great cost all down, down, the, down the line in terms of our criminal justice system. And we now have a broken system. Um, but I will say this, it is true that we are not uh, defining what nonviolent is, but that's because we don't need to. As I said before, the regulations will determine that, and you all will have a, 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 a part to play in that. And if you want to read more about this, read the LA Times, read you know the, 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 the uh, Orange County Register, a very conservative newspaper. Uh, every major newspaper in the, in, the, in the state has endorsed us. Uh, PolitiFact, look at PolitiFact, don't take it from me. Uh, look at the CDCR analysis. All of these basically contradict 100% what the DA is telling you. That's fear mongering. What I've explained to you is a fact. Thank you.
here so that you can respond to people's questions during the question and answer period. Oh, okay. Do you want us to stand up there? Uh, you can have a seat here and, and rise to people asking questions. Sure. Does anyone in the uh, is this working on? Okay, yeah. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Thanks for thank you both coming. How does this actually affect one of the biggest issues about overcrowding has been the mandatory sentencing sentencing laws that have forced judges to to uh, not take into account various conditions of the case. Is this and this true? Isn't this in a part trying to address and minimize that to a certain extent to give some flexibility into those laws? Either side. I can start with this one. I don't know what you mean by mandatory sentencing laws because we really don't have that in California. What we have, there's two different systems. There's the indeterminate sentencing law and the determinate sentencing law. Indeterminate sentences are like Kathy said, 25 to life. Those clearly are for the most serious crimes. There's a, a couple very rare ones that are, you know, lower than that. But, but for the most part, it's determinate sentencing. And in the example I gave you, I know I rushed over it. Most crimes in California that are felonies are given an option between probation or 16 months in the, in the state prison or two years or three years. Now, robbery, the one I mentioned earlier, is two years, three years, or five years, because it's a little more serious than the typical ones. Um, but the judges are not mandated, mandated to choose those. The judge can decide based on a whole laundry list of factors whether to give them probation or whether to give them 16 months, two years, or three years. So um, I, when people talk about mandatory sentencing, they actually may be talking about laws in different states or maybe the federal system, which I'm less familiar with. But they, but they, have, to go, they have to go to at least the minimum. The minimum. It, it's a three-tier system, which they must pick at least one of those. And, unless they go for probation, yes. Okay, so, so there is a minimum law. Yes and no. No, yes there is. AB 109 changed that. In 2011, when they changed the law, if, if, it's, if it's no longer going to state prison, it's now going to county jail, and the judge can choose anything. If the person's going to be sent to county jail for up to five years, the judge could decide, forget the two, three, five, I'm going to give you two months in county jail and spend the rest of it on a, it's not called probation, but it's essentially probation, okay. so that's been changed. Okay, so um, I'm going to pretend like I don't know what you're asking. Um, a big problem that we have today is these mandatory sentencing laws. When a prosecutor alleges uh, an allegation of, for example, a gang, a gang enhancement, where that a, a person was selling drugs and then he happens to be brown in the part, part side of town, they also often uh, apply the gang enhancement. And if found guilty of the crime and the, the for the benefit of a, a street gang uh, provision, then they have to, the judge has to impose the gang enhancement. Similarly with the gun crime, there are gun uh, enhancements that also apply. And so, and also the strikes. Second strike would require a judge to double your sentence and they have no discretion to deviate from the sentencing. And it absolutely has wrought havoc on our prison system. It has contributed to the lack of hope. It's contributed to uh, inability to really deal with our exploding prison population with, with really no alternatives. And so what we are proposing is not to in any way affect sentencing or charging practices, but rather once in the prison system, with the sentence intact, allow people to earn good time credits for which they can be released, but on parole. If they violate parole, then they return to, to finish the remainder of their sentence. We have no, no intention of undoing that which a court does, but we do have the discretion, and again, every state in the country has the discretion to award good time credits on the back end if a person earns that. And so yes, this is what, the enhancements, the mandatory minimum sentencing is what we are trying to address in a sensible way that restores discretion to the expert decision makers, that being CDCR, and a way for prosecutors who know very little about rehabilitation and prison administration. Are there any other questions from the audience? Help me understand something. I was an investigator for 21 years on the street. Under uh, 109, it seems to me 1,200 murderers have been released back onto the streets because the last crime they were convicted of was a murder. And um, if I remember correctly, just down the street here a few weeks ago, 
Taxis were being sent out for a special program sponsored by a bunch of city council <coughs> persons. Under Prop 47, we're resentencing convicted felons who've done their time. They're being reduced to misdemeanors. In fact, I have a neighbor, three-time felon, who is now carrying a gun and a bag because he's convicted of misdemeanors. He was uh, involved in the rape robbery of an 84-year-old woman. But it's not a violent offense. I'm a little confused here. Could you guys square some of this away from me? Well, first, let me just point out the obvious that we are not here to debate Prop 47. Uh, this is not Prop 47, this is Prop 57. What I know about Prop 47 is it reclassified certain low-level felonies like drug possession and, and petty theft to misdemeanors, not rape, not whatever it is that you raised. But to be clear, this is not what Prop 57 does. Do not confuse the, the driving force that is driven prison over count problem with the response. In that situation, you raised two things, AB 109. What that did was it, it shifted the responsibility over detaining and confining people from the state to the county. It had no distinction between rehabilitated and non-rehabilitated. What it did was it, it, it recategorized, or rather uh, it, it shifted based on their offenses. Low-level offenses went back to the county. Sheriffs should have provided rehabilitation. If they did not, and as a result, people in their care we were released in a deteriorated uh, uh, condition, who bears the responsibility? I say the sheriffs. Second, Prop 47, similarly, reduced uh, cla uh, the, the classification of confounders to misdemeanors and invested those savings in education and rehabilitation. That's not what this does. This places discretion about which kids are, are, are able to be tried as adults in the hands of judges. It, 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 it re reauthorizes CDCR to revamp their, their time credit scheme and award good time credits to people who earn them. And lastly, it enables certain people who are convicted of nonviolent offenses to have a parole consideration. And to be clear, the penal code that people seem to, refer to keep referring to determines, or rather, it, it, it has its function in the court procedure, right? Charging and sentencing. That has nothing to do with prison parole administration. And I'll give you an example. Non-violent does not necessarily mean everything that's not in the violent. It is objectively violent. For example, today our non-violent parole excludes all, all sex offenses that require sex registration, and it excludes all gun crimes. And it also, it, it can include so much more, just like in the context of immigration. You can be deported for something that's not on the violent list. Violent does not determine all the violent categories. That was a statute that was written by DAs. If DAs want to include more crimes in there, they can. They didn't the first time. I think you should ask why it's not on that list. I didn't write that law. The DA Association did. So to answer your question about Prop 47, the reason I brought up Prop 47 is because I wanted you folks to realize Prop 47 started a trend of giving misleading titles to these propositions. It was called the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Act. This one is called the Public Safety and Rehabilitation Act. Where does it talk about rehabilitation? Nowhere. It gives no programs to rehabilitate. It's just called that to try to convince you guys to vote for it. Because who has time to read these long laws? You folks are here. You folks take the time to educate yourself. Look around. <clears throat> Most people aren't here tonight. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're watching the presidential debates. If I could just add to what I have to say. Um, it seems to me, based on my own personal observation and experience, that most of the people in the room don't know that felons are currently being kicked out of prisons, sent back to the county. The county has no room at the end, and unfortunately, the state doesn't bother to fund uh, operations of jails. They'll fund expansions, but they won't pay for the, for the uh, jailers. And oh, by the way, they fired most of the parole agents, and that responsibility fell back on the probation department. And if you go down to the county and uh, try to talk to a probation officer, you're going to find out they have caseloads of three or 4,000 people. And if they're lucky, they'll see a parole violent offender under the probation uh, side because it fell back on the county. They'll see them at least a oh, couple of times a year. And if they get uh, out of bounds, well, there's nobody out there to chase them. 
I'll, I'll give my opponent one thing. He said one thing that was accurate in his response to your, to your question. The current law, because he's going to get 50% credits anyway, so the victim of his crime or some other crime isn't going to get him off the streets for seven years. They're going to get him off the street for three and a half. Now you can argue with whether that's good. The victims might say no. If you're the defendant's family, maybe you like it. But as it is, he's going to get 50% credit. Under this measure, he's going to have, he's probably going to serve about a year. A seven-year sentence a year. Why? Because this measure doesn't take away his seven-year sentence. What it does is give CDCR these people that we don't know, that we don't elect, that we don't get a chance to vote out of office if we don't like their decisions, and doesn't even tell them what things to base it on. It'll probably be based on how many people are at the end that day, and whether or not they need to kick people out. But it gives them the opportunity to say, all right, we're going to give you way more credits than you're entitled to over and above the 50%. And furthermore, those enhancements. So the guy only got two years on the main crime, but he's going to get five because he's a recidivist criminal. He's going to get five extra. It doesn't count those five. That guy is eligible for parole after one year on a seven-year sentence. He's right. It doesn't change the sentence. He's sentenced to seven years. But instead of doing three and a half, which is let's be transparent. Let's be able to tell our victims how long the guy that victimized you is going to be off the street. I'm going to have to tell my victim, frankly, I don't know, probably a year. But your seven-year sentence, go take that to the bank for what it's worth. I don't think that's fair. One, one final comment. When they get out today, they're entitled to housing. Can I just point out that I didn't get a chance to respond to that? So we're, yeah, so. Um, what, what, what I want to just point out again, um, the Board of Parole Commissioners is people that we absolutely know, Google. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very disturbed by a lot of the claims that the prosecutor behind me is making because either one, they're disappointed because she's knowingly lying, or B, because she's uninformed and has a fundamental lack of understanding of how the prison system works. It does not mean that anybody will be out in one year. Again, this has to be earned. It does not undo any sentence. You go in with a 15-year sentence that was doubled because of a second strike, you have a 15-year sentence. If you do nothing in prison, you serve 15 years, and you go home the way you are. You have to do nothing. If you want to go home sooner, you work for it. You engage in drug treatment and, and victims' awareness and gangs, uh, classes about gang mentality, and you go home in an improved state. You do not go home simply because you are eligible. The Board of Prison Hearings, again, look them up. They are sheriffs. They are uh, prosecutors, they're corrections officers that really know what's going on with these people. These hearings are four hour hearings in, 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 a, you know, in an average uh, hearing. They are far from the big and hard liberals. Our parole grant rate is about 20%. People who are released on parole return one per, less than 1% of the time. Under the current thing that the DA is advocating for, recidivism rate is between 60 and 70. To be clear, Prop 57 impacts only people that will be out one day. And, and you as a voting public have three choices in the matter. They can come home worse, they can come home the same, or they can come home better. You can continue to um, listen to them when they talk about Prop 47 and 8109, which has nothing to do with 57. I get why people don't like those. I, I see the, 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 the criticisms. Prop 57 is entirely different and again, it puts the hands in law enforcement officials. It, it, it's very interesting to me how when it benefits a certain group, it's all about law enforcement. When law enforcement is given, then they delegitimize those law enforcement officials. This makes sense because it puts discretion that is based on regulation, that's in statute, it is not hidden, it is out in the open, and you all, all will have a, a role to play in the regulations. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Mr. Guzman. When Prop um, 57 was certified for the ballot, its scope was quite limited. It talked about uh, taking away the direct viability from the prosecutor and giving that discretion back to the judges. Now, Californians are poised to pass Prop 54, which will stop the practice of gut and amending legislation. This proposition is a perfect example of gut and amend. Our democratic process, our democratic republic depends, its integrity depends on following the democratic process. Why should we let the governor get away with this gut and amend proposition? Well, first of all, if I flat out reject 
the proposition that this is a gut in the man, and I believe the Supreme Court of California would agree with me. This has already been litigated and decided, and you are wrong in, 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 in stating otherwise. This was not a gut in the man bill. Our, our initial draft dealt with restoring judicial discretion around who's trying to adopt, who isn't, and also increased parole eligibility for all young adults who went to prison while committing a crime under the age of 23. Those are not juveniles, and that is not the juvenile justice system. It dealt with prison, adults, and rehabilitation. When we uh, amended, all we did was expand opportunities for the entire prison population. Initially, it was about emphasizing rehabilitation in the context of juveniles that are, that are charged with serious crimes and people in, a, in the adult prison that were sent there as young adults, but adults nonetheless. Today, what it does is it, it, it focuses rehabilitation in, by restoring discretion to judges, by ensuring that kids who commit serious crimes will have a, a shot at rehabilitation, and again, emphasizing rehabilitation in the adult system. In the beginning, and right now, it is still first and foremost about rehabilitation, and it has always dealt with juveniles in the adult system and, and adults in the adult system. So with that, that's about it. Thank you. I appreciate you asking that question because that was my last slide that I did not get to. Here's what happened with Prop 57. So folks like him, they put it um, up for the, the law requires that if you have a ballot proposition, it has to be posted to, I think it's the Attorney General's website, and given a public comment period. They did that, and like I told you, not everyone disagrees with it. Not even everyone in my profession disagrees with the juvenile justice aspect provisions of it. I do, but some don't. Okay. After that public comment period closed, Governor Brown hijacked it. What he did, because he had to deal with this court stuff, because AB 109 apparently isn't relieving the, um, the prison system to the extent he needs it to, so he decided he wanted to put the adult stuff on there to get these people out sooner. That's why that they want to de um, increase the credits and decrease the amount of time you have to be spent to spend in before you're eligible for, for parole. He wants to let felons out earlier. He has to let prison, uh, felons out earlier. That's why he wants Prop 57 passed. He looked at it, he saw that these, these activists who have shown up today, they sat in the front row, you, know, you don't know it, but they've been laughing at my presentation the whole time, taking pictures of me, trying to intimidate me. These activists, he realized they have a large audience, uh, and, and he jumped on their, on their ballot proposition and put the adult stuff on. The adult stuff being um, reducing the amount of time you have to spend in before you're eligible for parole, and also um, awarding more credits to these people that are anonymous, they're prison staffers, we don't know who they are, and we don't know what criteria they'll base it on. He did hijack it. The original court in Sacramento said you can't do that. You needed to go through the public comment process. You changed the whole meaning of the, of the, of the initiative. Other people would have commented, perhaps, and you need to start over. Governor Brown got upset. He appealed it to the California Supreme Court. And to everyone's surprise, the California Supreme Court said, well, it's close enough. We're going to let you go forward. A lot of us disagree with that. We think that process stinks. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause to both our impassioned speakers. The next uh, proposition on tonight's agenda is Proposition 58. As uh, Kathy Schick pointed out, uh, there is no organized opposition. I have personally spoken to Mr. Ron Unz, who was instrumental in crafting Prop 227 to, uh, you know, basically alter, uh, ban, not ban, to require waivers before children were enrolled in bilingual education, and he uh, was unable to attend tonight. Uh, however, he and the proponents of this measure have argued their case on public radio. Uh, I know I listened to the debate, their debate on KQED. I encourage you to check it out. Ms. ortega Lampkin is Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education in the Lodi Unified School District. Um, good evening again. I'm Lodi Ortega Lamb, 
Rankin. I'm currently assistant superintendent in Lodi Unified School District. Um, I oversee 32 elementary schools. And just to give you a little bit of my background, I have been an, ed an educator for over 20 years. I started as a professional aide um, and became a classroom teacher, taught um, elementary school, middle school, became a vice principal at middle school, was a principal for 10 years, a director of the office overseeing elementary education in the Woodland Joint High School District, and now I'm very proud to be in Lodi as the superintendent. Um, I'm but I'm here today to represent, um, I'm also uh, president-elect for the California Association of Bilingual Education. And that is a statewide organization. We have over 3,000 members. Um, and um, so I'm here to represent that organization. I'm, I'm not here to represent Lodi Unified School District. Um, but I, I do have a lot of experience on the impact that 227 had on, um, on English learners and some barriers that it put in the way that many of our students could benefit from bilingual education. Um, Proposition 58 will enhance students in learning English as well provide opportunities for stu other students to acquire a second language. And so the reason we support Proposition 58 is because it's a good, it's a good thing for kids, it's, a, it's an option for families, and it's, uh, it's important for our um, community and our country to be prepared to be able to compete globally um, with, uh, with jobs and the, and the market and be able to co compete and communicate with other countries. And I, I, one of the um, personal ex experiences that I, I give um, I had the opportunity to um, travel to Brazil, and I've had many travel um, opportunities, but I went during the World Cup. And uh, when I was there in Brazil, uh, I was meeting many people from all over the world. It was, it was an amazing experience. And I kept getting asked, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> and so I was lucky enough to say I speak two languages. Um, and I would let them know that I was American. Um, and you know, they would, um, uh, most people that I spoke to spoke three, four, five languages. And you know, I happen to be one of the lucky ones that was bilingual, have a, a, a second language um, from, from the United States. And so um, that was a, an amazing experience for me because here in the States, I feel, my, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm bilingual, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset. I'm one of the few, but I felt out of place uh, when I was in Brazil when uh, other folks had three, four other languages and they had so much more advantages um, in being able to be communicate. Luckily, the Spanish is a very common language worldwide, so I was able to um, use that, uh, that of Spanish um, to communicate with many of the, of the people that I met in Brazil during the World Cup. And of course, English is also a very common, common language all around the world. And so this Proposition 58 not only addresses um, some of the barriers that 227 put in place, it made it more difficult for families to be able to access bilingual education. And for many, um, uh, and, and, par and parents having the, not having the information, uh, they have to come and ask for a waiver. As educators, we were not able to talk about bilingual education or try to design a, a program. We had to wait until parents came to the school and that they had enough information to actually ask for bilingual education. And it was mainly looked at as a program for English learners, kids who were trying to learn English. And so Proposition 58 kind of changes the way that it kind of opens it more wider for all our kids. Um, it is our belief that all students and all families should have the opportunity um, to be able to, to the opportunity to um, access a bilingual multicultural program, not just for English learners, but for our native English only students. Um, our students, all our kids deserve to have the opportunity and families should be able to have a choice and it should be a local choice, not a choice by a, 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 a lot of um, legislators. It should be a local choice where educators and parents can have a discussion about what is right for our school community, what programs should we offer, what languages should we offer for those families who want to choose and to have that option so they can be competitive in our global, globally. Um, there's many, many, many benefits of being bilingual, uh, being bilingual. I know I have benefited personally from being able to be competitive um, with jobs. I know it's helped me a lot in my, in my career, and I, um, I'm able to communicate with different communities. Um, with parents come at, in Lodi, we have a, lot, a, a huge Hispanic community, and I'm able to communicate directly um, with parents. Um, uh, so it's been a huge benefit for me. It also has opened my mind, opened my mind to be more sensitive and aware of cultures 
Um, and, and that's also a skill to be able to communicate and relate to that we're different. And that there's many things that we um, that uh, we can benefit from learning about differences and many things that we have in common. And it just makes kids be more open-minded um, and be able to uh, work in different organizations. The California Chamber of Commerce support Proposition 58. They have endorsed it. Um, California Teachers Association, um, School Boards Association. Um, there's very little opposition because this is a good thing for all kids and it's a local um, decision for the parents and for the school. And that's something not as mandating that you have to have a waiver and limited to only a certain population when all our kids should, could benefit from bilingual education. So I encourage the support um, and give this opportunity for all our kids and um, in California, we are globally, we are very globally competitive, and the more we prepare our students and our families um, to continue to um, improve our economy, it, it's in our best interest to provide opportunity for all kids to have bilingual education. So, hope we get a yes on our participation. Are there any questions from the audience? I apologize for seeming to be a catalyst around here. Um, during my 21 years on the street, uh, I visited 41 counties from Northern California. There are places like, uh, I can't think of the name of it, it's a little bit south of Merced, south and east of Merced. Uh, the high school no longer speaks English. It's a totally Spanish-speaking uh, school. My client, the child that I was looking out for there, had to be bused to Merced every day because her local high school no longer speaks Spanish. I've been in places like Five Points and, and some of the Southern Valley communities where uh, most of the signs are in Spanish, not in English. Um, if we don't teach our students to speak English, uh, what kind of a culture of the society are we going to have? Um, this, this proposition is not, uh, is not promoting not teaching English. As a matter of fact, that is the first priority. English is our primary language, the primary language of the state. It is our, our primary goal is to make sure that all our kids in, in public education um, are proficient in English. What this is promoting is that we have an opportunity to add an additional language, so that kids have multiple to have an opportunity to have multiple languages, not just one language. In many cases, in some communities, and you know, I'll be very honest with you, because I've been in this, I've worked in the Salinas Valley, and so there's a lot of um, migrant workers and a lot of families who come in with very limited English. Um, and some of those communities, at some, uh, it could be perceived if there's a school, and I'm not sure what this you're speaking of. Uh, if there's a school with a lot of migrant families, um, uh, especially if they're newcomers, the new to come to the, to the country, many times the primary language is used as a way to support them as they're acquiring English. So it could be perceived that it's a Spanish-only environment, um, and it really depends on the program and design. Um, in this particular proposition, it also uh, they would have to this would have to have, and in the LCAP, you have to put in what your measures are and whether the program is working or not in order to continue. Funding it. So there is accountability that comes with it. Um, and there has been community, and I think uh, it really, um, um, I, and I totally agree with you. We, we, English is primary, the primary focus, um, and the proposition is not debating that. It's just adding another language for kids, for us students and families to who want to choose that pathway. Well, thank you for being here with us. And I have a quick question, um, just because I do agree that we do need um, to have some flexibility. For me, I actually learned English on my own, um, something similar to Rosetta Stone. Um, I came back from Mexico. I was born here, but I went to Mexico for a year. And I went to kindergarten and learned it all on my own. Um, but I did face um, certain difficulties in learning the language. Um, I did attend college, graduate, still plan to go to ma get my master's. Um, but at the same time, I do see the difficulties in needing to have at least um, the teachers finding a way for us um, because 
for those of us that are bilingual, um, we have translations going on in our mind. And uh, for we need to learn, I feel that the state of California can definitely take this to the next level and do research on how to address um, these translations so everybody moves forward, not just Spanish speaking, but Chinese um, people that come in here with a different language from another country. Um, how can we be able to still them keep that language and enhance their English um, and how have them stay, you know continue with their studies and excel in both? Um, my question is, who would be creating this curriculum? Um, by who is it going to be led? And is it going to be more local, state, or nationwide? Um, because I do see that this is a really big step, and I want to learn about the accountability um, as to how this would go about in order for us to avoid challenges such as students then just staying um, in Spanish um, and never actually being able to excel in English as well. Right. Um, both is really important, but we wouldn't want someone to get all the way to their last year in high school and still be um, not able to learn English um, to a certain extent that they could go into college. Right. So I just want to learn about who, who would be leading um, this. So it would be a local control. Under um, Proposition 227, districts are limited on only a certain way for kids to learn um, English as a second language. There's limitations. And there's a lot of research um, out there on different models, bilingual models, dual version models, 90-10 models, 50-50 models. There's different kinds of models. So the district would be able to choose, um, pretend, you know, what the community wants, what languages are considering, you know, who the population is. They would be working with the teachers who have expertise, the districts and the county offices and uh, state, state department of education to decide to pick the design of the program that they want to implement. And so they're not limited um, to uh, the Proposition 227. So this advances and enhances the opportunities for kids to look at what, um, student districts to look at what research says about how language is best acquired and not just stuck, because right now we're really limited. We have our hands tied and, and you have to have like charters um, and, and only our English learners are the ones basically in bilingual programs. And if you have a strong bilingual program, to me it is like a gate enhanced program. And what a shame that our English native speakers do not have an opportunity also to acquire a second language. It should not just be our Spanish speakers or our migrant students to come or immigrant students. It should be an opportunity for all our kids. If you want to learn um, at Chinese or Italian, um, you know, uh, uh, different languages, they should have uh, the Spanish if they want to be able to compete. So this, this initiative just enhances those opportunities. Again, putting uh, English is not it's not a side, that's, that's primary. Um, for some of our kids who come in without knowing English, um, we want to make sure that they maintain their language and then they add that language, but that we make that we monitor and then we hold our accountable. Because it's going to be a local control, it has to go in the LCAP, and under the LCAP, we are required to turn in um, uh, what assessments we're going to use, what measures we're going to use, and report to the state, report to our school boards. And so this, uh, this is a great opportunity. It's, and it's a local control. If communities do not want bilingual education for their students, is that something that's going to be forced upon? Um, right now, 227 is forced upon us of avoiding to provide that opportunity for students. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Hi, thanks for coming. So, so the proposition is mainly aimed at addressing low performance of uh, students, uh, second language, uh, acquiring English skills in school, correct? When the Proposition 227? No, no. Oh, this, this, this is, is, is the right. problem. No. So the, the issue is saying, if I read the proposition about it, right, saying that you have uh, English second learners struggling in school with language and writing skills, and and this is to help to address that, correct? Mm -hmm. It's part of it, because there are kids who come in for, and in 227, they have to transition right away into an English-only program, mm -hmm. right away after a year. And so for many kids who are front, who let's say, if you go at this, this for, ourself, for example, if I go to China, and I, I am forced to be learning everything in Chinese, and no one can translate anything for me, I'm going to get behind in math, I'm going to get behind in social studies, I'm going to get behind everything, because all the focus is going to be on Chinese, learning Chinese. So many of those kids get behind, right? We're forcing, just focusing on the English, which is, we need to do that. I, if I'm in China, I have to learn Chinese if I'm gonna live in China. But at the same time, I don't wanna get behind in other skills. So this proposal, proposal, proposal is for districts who 
feel that English learners can benefit from a bilingual program that where they can be learning English at the same time maintaining their language. And those research studies have shown that those students in those programs perform better academically. So we are, the proposition is an opportunity for districts to be able to make those decisions locally. Right, okay, I, I this as being a school psychologist in the county. Okay, most, out of the 20%, probably, what, 15, 20% are monolingual at home, which impedes their ability to acquire English in the schools, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. So really what this is, it's not addressing the children's ability to learn in a sense, it's kind of addressing this issue that you're maintaining a specific monolingual language at home that's not kind of coming along with them to help promote the English language. You see what I'm, kind of where I'm getting at? I'm not trying to be racial about it, I'm just saying, it, and, and, and I understand that you come from a country, you're sticking with your language, but it impedes the students from being able to acquire language if they can't go, go home and practice and speak in a language that they're trying to learn, right? I understand, I understand. And a huge proportion of these students that we do with also come in that are also functionally illiterate in their own languages. Okay? So the, this issue about the bilingual issue is kind of concerning to me. Not only that, it has a tendency in California to be locked in, primarily in Hispanic, in the Hispanic culture, but yet you go into, in, let's say, Sacramento, huge Russian culture. And all of a sudden this opens up the fact that schools now are going to have to then really, if they're going to not face non-discrimination issues, to, to be able to uh, have to address this across uh, multiple numbers of languages, including all the Southeast Asian languages and all of this. And I just don't see how that is financially viable with the current budget issues within the schools. Okay, and, and, and I'm not, I, I, I totally support what we're trying to get with students, absolutely. But I'm just not sure that, that this is the way to do that. And, that's, that's and, that, and there is so much, for years, there's been so much um, opinion about bilingual education, and I, I totally see your point. And this gives that both parents and the school to make those decisions locally. Um, some, with, with a well-designed bilingual program, many of those kids can benefit more if they have a big, rich primary language support, they already come into school knowing literacy, knowing how to read. Once you know how to read one language, you know how to read, pick up in another language. It's having those, uh, that foundation. For some families, don't want, don't want it. And so it's really a local choice. And so what this proposition is saying, let it be a local choice and have parents decide based on their research, based on what they feel is right for them, based on what staff they have available at the school, what decisions they want to make to make it be a local decision and have given an opportunity to enhance opportunities for bilingual education for both schools and parents who want it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming to see me. Thank you for coming tonight to educate us. I wanted to know your opinion because it sounds like you've kind of lived through that plus you're an educator yourself. What is your opinion on the students that already speak English whose parents have enrolled them in, in an extra bilingual program where they're learning history and math and let's say Spanish even though they're native English speakers. Like you mentioned, they go home and they speak English. Do you think it inhibits them from learning math and history and those things? I've just been curious about that. Um, kids thrive on it. And I mean, the parents um, who of English only families who are pushing for their kids to be, they've done their research and those kids thrive and they end up going, getting college credits for their required second language at the college level. They're already advanced. Um, and so I, because they have that strong English foundation already, they, they learned it went to preschool and they're able to pick up another language. And normally, those families who are only English-only speakers who are in, um, in bilingual programs, they want to be totally immersed. They'd rather be all in Spanish because they already know that the English is going to be picked up. Um, I tend to support 50-50 models myself, personally, because I want to have it to be even for all kids. Um, to, because sometimes I feel like some of our, um, and there's different ways of looking at different models depending on the community again, but again. But I have, I have experience when in a particular school that I um, was not having success in the 90-10 model. The kids who were being successful were the, only, the English only speakers. They were thriving. They were in a gate advanced program and they were thriving. The kids who were not being as successful were English learners because they were not getting as much exposure as the English as you just pointed out. So I worked with that school and redesigned it to a 50-50 model to a level, a level of playing field and to making sure that both were being challenged with the second language. Um, so but again, it really depends on your community and the model of parent support. Is this not something that um, is, 
can be taken lightly because we can't just start putting five programs together. Um, it, it's, got, it's got to be, it has to have all these right, right um, ingredi uh, ingredients and, and training. Uh, and California Association of Bilingual Education, we have lots of resources and trainers. Um, so, and we know that it works when it's designed well. Um, but yet, for your English learners, English only students, sometimes they're the ones who benefit us the most. Are, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks to Ms. Ortega Bosch. Speaking in favor of the proposition is Mr. Rand Martin. Mr. Martin has been working in and around the Capitol for more than 30 years. He was the founding executive director of the First of the Nation AIDS lobbying organization and is currently a partner in MBM Strategy Group. His firm represents a wide range of clients, including United Airlines, the California Charter Schools Association, the Public Health Institute, and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, the proponent of two initiatives in November, Prop 60 and 61. Speaking against the measure will be Mr. Nick Bondage. Mr. Nick Bondage represents the No on 61 campaign. This campaign is noted earlier received significant funding from pharma, the pharmaceutical industry's trade group. However, the campaign has a long list of endorsements from a variety of community and professional coalitions, such as veterans organizations, healthcare groups, such as the California Medical Association. Please welcome Mr. Martin. Good evening, thank you. Thank you for having me. I see it's a small crowd, but clearly a crowd that's committed to learning about uh, these initiatives. Um, I think as was mentioned earlier, it's a 200 and some page um, ballot pamphlet you're gonna have to wade through. And so hopefully uh, venues like this will give people an opportunity to learn a bit more about the initiatives. So uh, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, which has been my client um, in Sacramento since 2002, has long had on its um, list of policy and goals um, to get drug prices down in the state of California. Um, we go back years on this issue. This is not something that we're late to. We actually sponsored bills several times um, in the last 14 years in the legislature, trying to get something accomplished to bring uh, drug prices down. Um, and unfortunately, we've been stymied at, at every turn um, by a legislature that is um, unwilling to take on uh, the drug companies um, and, uh, and have continually blocked bills from, from moving forward. Um, we had one bill that actually got out of the legislature, um, but unfortunately Governor Schwarzenegger just signed uh, uh, vetoed it. Um, so eventually AHF, which is the largest provider of care and treatment to people with HIV and AIDS in the world, um, decided that enough is enough. Um, and we're not going to get drug prices down if we continue to go back to a legislature that is not willing to address the issue. And so we went to the ballot. And we went back, went to the ballot with a very simple measure one that we had tried to get through the legislature um, about a decade ago, that simply says that the price that the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs pays for uh, pharmaceutical drugs for the veterans that it serves um, is the price that the state of California should also be paying. If it's good for our veterans, it's good for our citizens. Um, it's a very simple measure, it's a very straightforward measure. People have complained that we didn't write 100 pages um, with all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, the possible unintended consequences of, of a measure like this and try and fix everything. What we wanted to do was what the legislature should always do. You should, the legislature should be passing a bill that takes a policy and then gives it to the state of California, the administration, to implement. That's what we're asking the voters to do, adopt this policy, and then we'll let the Department of Healthcare Services and Department of Corrections and CalPERS and all the other entities um, take this on and find ways to make it work. There's no question, anybody sitting in this room, all you have to do is open a paper on almost any given day and you're gonna read something about the exorbitant increases in drug prices. We, we just saw this most recently with EpiPens that in nine years went from $109 for a two pack kit to $600. $500 for something that had been around forever. We saw another case for people with, um, with HIV and with, with Hep C, where a company here in California, one of our own homegrown companies, Gilead, bought a company on the East Coast 
that had a drug um, to deal with hep C. A very good drug that this company spent a lot of money in development. Gilead spent $11 billion to purchase the company and brought that drug into their uh, portfolio. Um, and then turned around and charged an exorbitant amount, um, about $1,000 a pill, um, uh, for people with hep C. Uh, a good drug, I'm not saying anything about the drug, but the cost was just outrageously expensive. Um, and what really tells you how much the drug prices drive the, the, the benefit of the drug companies is that in one year of charging $1,000 a pill, Gilead made up every single dollar that they spent on purchasing this small pharmaceutical company that developed uh, Sobaldi, the, the Hep C drug. That's outrageous. We're, and we're paying for it. And that's, and that's what's got us up. And those are just two examples of how, of how this happens on a, on, a, on a frequent basis. We see drug, drugs that didn't cost anything yesterday suddenly cost $1,000 tomorrow. And that's something that absolutely has to stop. Now, one of the things that the opponents will say, which, which I laugh every time I hear, is that we are not uh, addressing this for 100% of the people in California. You will see ads that say, we're only dealing with 12% of the, of the population in California. Yeah, we're dealing with 12% of the population in California because the population that we're dealing with are the people that the state of California has to pay for their, their medication. So this is a taxpayer issue. This is not an issue to drive a reduction in drug prices for everybody. It will, no doubt about it. Once Prop 61 passes, there will be a turnaround in the pharmaceutical industry that will be unbelievable, to quote um, the Republican nominee for president, um, because it would, the halo effect of passing Prop 61 will have an impact on pharmaceutical uh, prices, not only throughout California, but, but across, uh, across the country. But, but the fact that we're only dealing with the people who are served by the people of California is driven by the desire to get state spending on medical care down. We faced, three or four years ago, a, de a decision by the Brown administration, fortunately not enacted, to add a copay to everybody who's on Medi-Cal. People on Medi-Cal can't afford medical care, and he was proposing to add a copay. And the reason he did that is because the recession was so bad that they were having to make cuts. And so part of our calculation in putting this forward was, we don't want to face decisions in the future in the legislature and the governor where we add costs to poor people in California simply to make up for the cost of the drugs that we're spending to give John Martin, the former CEO of Gilead, $180 million out. So that's, the, that's where we want to go with this. We hope in the long run it will, will change um, minds and, and actions across the, across the country. But clearly we need to start somewhere. This is where we start and we're very proud of it. Um, we are supported by the California Nurses Association, AARP, California Association of Retired Americans, California State Retirees, Vote Vet, which is one of the uh, major veterans organizations that uh, is involved in political campaigns and a number of other uh, organizations. Um, you will hear the opposition talk about how they are supported by a number of different organizations. Find out how much the drug companies have been spending for years on some of these organizations. Funnel, funneling funds into their, into their services. That's great. They really should be helping organizations provide services. But then to turn around and compel those organizations to oppose something that's in their best interest um, is really criminal. Um, we hope that you will look at the millions of dollars that doctors are receiving um, and it, it led to the California Medical Association opposing this initiative. Not because they don't agree that drug prices should come down. Ask any doctor if they think they should come down. But because they don't want to lose the largesse of the pharmaceutical industry by opposing them on this very central issue. Um, I'll stop there and let my opponent um, have his 10 minutes and look forward to ask, answering any questions. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Nick Bonich. I'm with the No on Prop 61 campaign. 
And first, I you know want to thank my opponent for pointing out that this initiative has unintended consequences, and that's the way they've written it. It's a poorly drafted measure, and it's poorly written. Every single newspaper across the state of California has come out in opposition to this initiative. Democratic organizations such as the San Francisco Democratic Party have come out opposed to this initiative. LGBT organizations such as the Harvey Milk LGBT Club in San Francisco are opposed to this initiative. The Alice Toklas LGBT Democratic Club in San Francisco is opposed to this initiative. Right here in Stockton, the Central Valley Stonewall Democratic Club is opposed to this initiative. In Fresno, the Fresno Stonewall Democratic Club is opposed to this initiative. In Sacramento, the Sacramento Democratic Stonewall Club is opposed to this initiative. The Los Angeles County Young Democrats are opposed to this initiative. Many groups have come out opposed to this initiative, including the California Medical Association, a group of doctors that do want to lower prescription drug prices, but want to do it the right way, a way that is effective and not ineffective. And this initiative is ineffective, and it's not going to do what it says it's going to do. He spent half of his time not even talking about the initiative, so let's get into the details about the initiative, and, and I will tell you what the Legislative Analyst Office has said about this initiative, and point out the problems with this initiative. The Legislative Analyst Office is a nonpartisan uh, a group in the Capitol that analyzes this legislation, basically comes forward with the facts, and it's not on either side. Um, first of all, this initiative says that it will match the price that the VA is paying. That is true for folks on uh, Medi-Cal fee-for-service and some other government programs. But it excludes folks on Medi-Cal managed care. Most people are on Medi-Cal managed care programs. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation runs a Medi-Cal managed, pro managed care program. So the author of this initiative, Michael Weinstein, has excluded himself from the initiative. We really don't know why, obviously, he doesn't believe in the only law, the law that he's written. Additionally, when the VA negotiates for prices, those prices come out on a formulary list. But then the VA goes back and negotiates for even lower price cuts under additional contracts that are made confidential. I want to emphasize the word confidential. If those contracts are made confidential, nobody can find out what they are. The state cannot find out what they are. So therefore, how is the state going to match those prices? There's going to be a lot of problems here. But the state is going to need to buy the medication for its patients. But the state might be breaking the law. It's not matching the price that the VA is paying. So there are huge consequences uh, to this initiative. Um, additionally, um, let's see. Some of the uh, other things I want to point out are um, Numerous organizations that work in the AIDS healthcare industry and the LGBT uh, industry, or L LGBT organizations, um, have taken no position on this initiative. These are groups that work in the same business, obviously, as Mr. Weinstein. The San Francisco AIDS Foundation has not taken a position on this initiative. The Los Angeles, um, Los Angeles um, AIDS uh, Project, um, AIDS Los Los Angeles Project H Foundation has not taken a position. The San Francisco LGBT Center has not taken a position. The Los Angeles LGBT Center has not taken a position. Planned Parenthood has not taken a position. The California Democratic Party has not taken a position. Planned Parenthood has, at the moment, still not taken a position. Most groups are either opposed to this initiative or have not taken a position. He basically read off the major groups that support his side. That's about it. I think there was about five of them. Most of them are either on our side or they're saying, wait a minute, hands off. This thing is so poorly written, we don't want to be a part of it. So, you know, I really think, you know, it's important to um, understand where all these groups are coming from, where the legislative analyst is coming from, where the newspaper groups are coming from, where these LGBT groups are coming from, these AIDS groups, et cetera, et cetera, democratic groups. For us to understand, you know, this is a broad-based coalition, veterans groups, every veterans group is opposed to this initiative. Uh, the NAACP is opposed to this initiative. Numerous, numerous, numerous groups are uh, opposed to this initiative. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Mr. Rand, your rebuttal. Well, since you were here and not watching the debate tonight, you won't get this reference, but at least I wasn't called a nasty woman like 
Donald Trump called uh, Hillary Clinton towards the end of uh, an hour and a half tonight. Um, so <laughs> we can go toe to toe on which organizations support, which organizations oppose. Lots of Democratic clubs, lots of Democratic Central Committees um, support this initiative. So you know, I'm not going to waste my five minutes talking about uh, about organizations that support and oppose. I will take my five minutes and, and get a bit more into the weeds on this initiative. Um, so uh, the No on 61 campaign likes to point out that this is an unworkable initiative because nobody knows what the VA price is. If you don't know what the VA price is, how can you possibly know whether you're complying with it? That's a lie. And I, and, I, and I hate to say it, but it's a lie. And it's a lie that was um, uh, uh, uncovered by the VA itself when we issued a freedom of information request months ago. And they came back and told us, yeah, it's public information. And it's on a website. And you can go to the website and you can enter the drug. You can enter the milligrams uh, for that drug and it'll give you a price. Not just for VA, but for a number of different um, federal payers. So the information is there. You know, it's, it is a simple initiative. I know, and, and we pride ourselves on that. We should not be, as the voters of California, deciding how to implement a policy as complex and arcane as pharmaceutical drug pricing. We need to leave it up to the departments that know how to do that. Give them the tools, give them the information, and then turn it and, and leave it to them to actually implement um, implement the law. Um, it's it's incredibly important for all of us. To, to let the state do what it needs to do rather than continuing to negotiate in secret. Secret, I think that's something I, I, I'm always amazed at. The pharmaceutical contracts are not public information. You cannot even ask for a Public Records Act request on pharmaceutical contracts. It is prohibited under state law. And so we have no idea. AHF, AIDS Healthcare Foundation, our contracts are totally public. So we, we have to tell the public how much we're spending, what it costs us to provide services to people with HIV. Does Gilead or GlaxoSmithKline have to tell the public how much they're charging the state of California for one of their drugs? No. And that's the, the, the dissonance in this debate. The pharmaceutical companies are allowed to get away with murder and effectively do because some people can't get their drugs um, while we, who are the rest of the public, are required to be public about what we, what we provide. So all we're doing now is leveling the play, playing field. We have played at pharmaceutical industry's table for decades. It is time to end that. It is time for the pharmaceutical company to come to the state of California's table and play on the state of California's rules. And that's what Prop 61 does. Thank you. Oh, I have two more minutes? <laughs> Mr. Bonnevick, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Hi. Yes, um, he brought up that the VA prices are made public. That is the formulary list that, that is made public. The VA negotiates for about a 24% discount, and those prices are made public but they negotiate for even lower prices. And the average, they get 40% discounts on their prices. Those are the contracts that are under confidentiality agreements. Those are the, are the prices that will not be released. And that difference between 24 to 40% is about $4 billion. $4 billion, okay? On top of that, this initiative does not set prices at a certain amount. It sets it at what the VA pays. There's no guarantee here. The VA prices might go up. The VA prices might go down. Anything can happen. This initiative is riddled with attempts for lawsuits. On top of it, I want to point out that if this initiative does go to the courts and it isn't, isn't goes, and there are lawsuits, the author of the initiative, Michael Weinstein, has written into the initiative that he will defend it. I don't know if you guys remember Proposition 8, but the Attorney General refused to defend it. It was the gay marriage initiative, and so the proponents had to go defend it. Well, they paid for it themselves. Weinstein learned from this mistake, and he's going to foot the bill on the taxpayers no matter how long it takes, and he has written that into the initiative. We understand 
that, you know, I'm here representing Prop 61. The, the, the opposition to Prop 61. And I understand there might be other concerns about what's going on in society and with healthcare. Healthcare is a very complicated topic, a very complicated issue, and in all aspects of it, you know, it needs reform. And everyone's even talking about that. I think recently I read a quote the Democratic governor of Minnesota said, you know, there needs to be some changes what's going on in his state. So yes, changes, there needs to be, changes need to be addressed. Issues need to be addressed, but in the right way not in the wrong way. And I want to um, read a quote from the Legislative Analyst's Office um, analysis of the bill, and it specifically says, according to the VA, however, the database of these drug prices may not display the lowest prices paid for some drugs for some drugs for which the VA obtains additional negotiated discounts, right from the LAO. Right from the LAO, located in the state capital that provides nonpartisan information. So again, I think it is important to understand the specifics of the legislation and understand why every newspaper across the state is opposed to this initiative and why there are so many groups that have come out against it. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'd like to invite Mr. Martin back to the lectern to uh, answer questions from the audience. I'll be down. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Thank you. You both have given us a lot to think about. Um, I wanted to ask if it would be, if we could say that it's every great um, project in life has to start with a little step. So wouldn't this be the first step to uh, getting more universal health care, which is one thing, oh, no, um, to get every bit of information from the VA uh, ultimately about um, how much is being negotiated, what the prices are. And when we start with a little bit of information, the prices would go down for many people in the state. The taxpayers wouldn't have to pay as much for the drugs for these people. So wouldn't it be worth this uh, passing this bill to get that result. When you say information, what do you mean information? Well, about the drug costs that you said were secretly less than uh, they are negotiated by the, between the VA and the pharmaceutical companies, but but the other folks don't know what those prices are that beyond what we see in the formularies. Um, so I mean, even if it were just what the VA paid, what is obvious in the formularies, at least that's a starting. Yeah, but it, the initiative says it has to be with the, with the VA is paying the lowest price. Mm -hmm. The lowest price isn't in the formulary list. Well, they'll have to tell. But they, they what? They'll have to tell. No, because they're under confidentiality agreements, so they don't have to tell. Now, we're talking about, we're talking about, well, too bad, too bad is lawsuits. Too bad is not changing anything, not lowering drug prices, and things going to the court, and the taxpayers you, paying paying to put the bill for uh, Mr. Weinstein to, uh, um, to defend this initiative. But wouldn't the formulary prices that the VA will be, that would be paid, do still be lower than what the- Yeah, but the initiative says it has to, pay, has to be what the VA is paying. Mm -hmm. So that is not the price necessarily. Oh, you're saying the it's the lowest. Oh, exactly, okay. exactly. So, so a couple of responses. Um, first, as I indicated, numerous bills have been introduced over the years um, to try and do something. We've tried controlling doctors' marketing abilities, and we've tried importing drugs from Canada, and we've tried the VA approach. And even this past session, two bills were introduced and defeated that simply would have provided greater transparency. So my opponent says, this is the wrong initiative. This one doesn't work. So let's, let's come back and let's do one that works. Well, we've been trying, AHF has been trying for 14 years to try and get the pharmaceutical industry to step up and find solutions that work. They're not interested in finding solutions that work. They just want to defeat this initiative, which is why they poured $94 million into defeating it. So they can keep doing things the way they, the way they are. The other, one, uh, the other response I want to make in direct um, uh, 
reaction to this exchange was relative to the VA. One of the things my opponent is failing to advise you is that there's language written into the, into the initiative that basically says to the extent that federal law allows you to do something, you can do it. So federal law prohibits you from getting this extra money that the, that the VA is getting for some of these drugs below the form barrier. Then the law allows the state of California to comply with the law, with the initiative, at the 24% reduction that's in the, that's in the form barrier. The law is very specific that allows it to do that. But it doesn't serve the opposition this narrative to not to, to mention to, to mention that element of it. And I would point out that a 24% reduction, which is what the federal government says the VA in its formulary represents below Medicaid is a pretty good reduction and would go a long way to helping a lot of people. I, I also just need to respond to, if I can, respond to one other thing. He has has tried to to simplify the issue of Medi-Cal managed care as not understanding why it's exempted from the law. The reason it's exempted from the law actually should serve the pharmaceutical industries because Medi-Cal managed care costs are based on real world costs under fee-for-service. So what you end up doing by having this apply to both fee-for-service, which it does, and Medi-Cal managed care is to double the reduction. And maybe we should have done that. Maybe we should have hit them twice on the same drug. But no, we decided that we would focus on fee-for-service. Medi-Cal managed care would ultimately end up reducing the drug prices because fee-for-service reduces the drug prices. Thank you. I have a question for uh, the opposition. But actually, it's a two-part question. And I'd actually like to look at your The 24% formulary discount that the VA gets from the pharmaceuticals, that's, is that based on a price break due to purchases in bulk? Uh, I, I believe it's, it's, it's a negotiated okay. price break. Yeah. All right, so but that's, that's public record, right? Yes. OK, so the additional up to 40% price break that they get. It's not up to, it's actually an average of 40%. An average, OK. So it's even better than that. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so they, they give that for, pharmaceuticals provide that to the VA for, for whatever reason, whether it be whatever. OK, what, there's no statutory mandate that I'm aware of that requires pharmaceuticals to provide any kind of price break whatsoever to the VA, correct? Mm. Right, so no, what, no, okay, so no. now, now, now my point's directed at the, the pro to this. If there's no statutory requirement for the VA to be provided any, any price breaks by the pharmaceuticals, sir, and you're mandating that the rest of the state of California has to follow suit with the price break where the price is set forth by the VA, what's the, What's the motivation for the pharmaceuticals to provide any kind of price break towards the VA at all? Then the, the entire state's going to pay a higher price. I'm sorry, you, you, I appreciate the question. You misunderstood my response to your question about whether there is law. There is law. The Veterans Health Benefits Act of 1992, it's adopted by Congress, um, sets forth the process whereby um, pharmaceutical companies have to negotiate with the VA to get a price. Um, that is acceptable to the VA. So there is very clear law, federal law, that requires that. There's clear law, but what, at what level is it made? Well, it's a process. It's not. I'm, I'm tracking that. But then, if that's the case, then it seems to me that the pharmaceuticals have no, they're not compelled in any way to provide anything more than they're statutory or required to do so. Doesn't that mean that the rest of the price for the rest of us, since we have to follow suit, is going to go increase? I'm, I'm not sure I follow why the would follow suit that the prices would increase. There's no there's no compulsion on on behalf of the the pharmaceutical industry to provide anything up to 24 percent outside of what they're mandatory or what they're mandated by statute. Okay, that's correct. We so the down 20, to 24 percent. Right. So the 24 percent at this point is ambiguous because it's not relegated by the, by, the, uh, by the feds. What my point is, is if, let's say it is at 10%, the prices will go up to that 10% reduction, and then the rest of us will have to pay an increase that, that falls suit to the VA. There's, what, 
Do you follow me? No, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand why you think it would go up 10%. But, but, and there's another element maybe would, would help to, to flesh this out of it. The Veterans Health Benefits Act also prohibits the pharmaceutical companies from raising the price in any given year more than the CPI. So we're talking about, you know, last year, 0.8%. Okay, yes. So they could, ra they could raise their price 0.8% um, in, any, in any given year. And that's all that they could raise, that they could raise the price. I so the threats that the, that the pharmaceutical companies are making, that they're just simply going to go out and raise prices throughout the Veterans Administration is, is inaccurate because it, it, uh, it would violate um, federal law. Okay, that's not my point though. Okay, if the price, <laughs> I'm sorry, if the price I'm, I'm, trying. Trying. I'm trying to explain it. If okay. You, on. If the price is a dollar for a pill, let's just keep it simple, and if they get a 24% decrease or 24% um, reduction in the cost, that's 76 cents, mm -hmm. okay? So, if the VA is paying 76 cents a pill, just to keep it simple, all right, but they're not mandated to show that 24% decrease. The, the pharmaceuticals aren't mandated to provide that 24% decrease, but they are mandated for, to provide a decrease in some level, be it an arbitrary number like 10, 12, 15%, whatever it is, all right? We're no longer paying 76 cents a pill. We're gonna pay whatever they're mandated to, to put the cost at for the VA. You copy? So now we're gonna be paying 88 cents a pill, all right? The entire state of California has to follow suit by statute if, if your law is, a, is an act. Uh, okay, I, so, two, so two things. One is, and, and I'm sure it's the lateness of the hour, but you just reminded me of something that's in the Veterans Health Benefits Act that I had forgotten about. And that is that there is actually a specific percentage. Um, and thank you for saying 76 cents because it's actually 76 percent. So the, the health benefit, the VA has to negotiate, the pharmaceutical companies have to negotiate um, uh, pharmaceutical prices that are 70 percent, 76 percent of what they refer to as the big four price, which is 24 percent higher than that. So there is a, a statutory mandate. And I apologize for misleading initially by not remembering that percentage. So there is that plus the CPI increase that would limit what the what they could increase. Now, what else you can get between the pharmaceutical companies and the VA beyond that, nobody knows because that's all a state secret. So, so if there's if there if the pharmaceutical companies could could come back and and uh, negotiate that additional discount away. Um, then you know that's the pharmaceutical companies acting in bad faith with the people of California and with people and with veterans. You know, the good thing though for veterans, and this is what's so frustrating about veterans acts uh, organizations being um, uh, uh, encouraged to oppose this initiative, is that nothing the pharmaceutical companies can do to the federal VA will ever affect a veteran because the VA does not charge veterans a single dollar. No, so contrary. Huh? Not contrary. Oh, well, we, we can have that debate. There are work for the VA for 35 years, and I can assure you there are co pays for veterans. Well, okay, co pays is different than charging them for pharmaceuticals. I'm talking about co pays for pharmaceuticals. One of the, I was an investigator for VA, and one of the biggest problems we had, we only had six investigators for this area. And we had to have an undercover investigator literally in the VA pharmacy constantly because of the amount of drugs that was out the back door. Um, it's, it's an enormous uh, problem to control that medication in the VA pharmacy. But veterans do pay a copay for their medications by all means. Um, and currently the VA charges your Medicare, your Medi-Cal, your private insurance, Whatever coverage a veteran has is charged by the VA back in order to recover the cost of care. I would reiterate my assertion that a copay is different than paying for the cost. I pay copays. I'm sure most of us do pay copays when we go to the pharmacy, pharmacy to buy our drugs. That's not the price of the drug. So, and that the, the copay remains the same regardless of what the, happens to the, the to the price of the drug. So the VA would continue to pay, charge you ten dollars for your copay, whether the price of the drug was ten dollars 
$4,000. And that's, that's the point that veterans would not suffer from, from the pharmaceutical industry acting um, belligerently and taking it out on veterans if this initiative passes. We have time for one more question tonight. I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Mine isn't so much a question as the drug companies are still getting billions upon billions upon billions from the VA. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're making a lot of money off of it. That's why they offer another 40% discount. They're still making one heck of a lot of money. If, if I could speak to that. Um, I'm sorry, that's all we have time for this evening. Can I? Oh, you, you can make a, a response. Yeah, sorry. yeah just real quick. Because I didn't even make a comment with his question. I was answered one question. Um, you know, I, I want to point out, you know, that he said, you know, maybe we should have included this in the initiative. Maybe. You know, yeah, there's a lot of maybes with this initiative. And that's why the LAO and so many newspaper groups and so many newspapers have come out and post this initiative because it's really poorly written and it's poorly drafted. Um, he also brought up managed care and the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation actually is one of the few managed care uh, departments that actually purchases drugs directly. It, it's not affected by fee for service. So again, the person, Michael Weinstein, who's written this initiative, has again written himself out of the initiative. Um, so yeah, that's it. I also have some literature I can leave in the back as well if you all want to pick up on your way out. discussions on the propositions. Thank you all for attending. I hope to see you next week when we, the discussion will be on Proposition 62 and 66 and Proposition 64.